Gordy, thank you for teaching us about the history of uh, what we're going to be looking at here. What was Toronto like when this magnificent building was built? Well, you have to really go back into a different world. Toronto is a, a small city compared to today. It's roughly 80,000 people. It's predominantly European, Western European. It's not this ethnically diverse community that we think of Toronto today. It's, if you're standing in front of the building, the Royal Conservatory building, which is McMaster University building eventually, 15 minutes north, you're in the country. If you walk along Bloor to the viaduct, well, the viaduct's not there. You can't get across the, the, the Don. And the old, old city hall is not even there yet. And you've got horse and carriage on the street. You have some railway, but it's, it's, it's a very different city. The tallest building is 12 stories high. So it is remarkable then that this beautiful structure gets built. But tell us about first the McMaster family. Well, William McMaster is an Irish immigrant. He moved to New York City in the States, very quickly came to Toronto and established himself in the business world, dry goods industry. And that's where he made his fortune, dry goods on Young Street, south of, uh, south of Bloor. He became very successful as a businessman, but he was interested in reform, became a politician, became a senator, but he also was a banker. He founded one of the founders of Canadian Bank of Commerce, and so a very prosperous, successful businessman. He was married twice. He married uh, Mary at first, and she died, and so he remarried a Susan Moulton, who was a wealthy widow from the States. She had had a a uh, businessman who had, for her husband and died, and so she had her own wealth, and he had his wealth from all his industry. And he never had children, they never had children, and so it's him and his wife, and they're establishing this uh, reputation among Torontonians as very successful, uh, prominent, and powerful uh, business people. And what was their dream for teaching the Bible? His dream was to found a school in Toronto, the heart of southern Ontario, and Ontario politics and culture. And so some didn't want that. Some said, well, the, the, a rural environment's better for training pastors, but he wanted it in the hub of, of what was taking place in Ontario. And so the dream was to establish a Baptist school that taught liberal arts and Bible, training of ministers, but also providing a university education for students. And so at the heart of the, of the, the university is this idea of, in Christ all things consist. That's the founding motto of the university. Now they're close to the University of Toronto. They're just, you know, north of just the University of Toronto. Down Philosopher's Path Just here. down yeah. the path. And so they want to do a similar thing that other denominations are doing. The Anglicans have their schools, the Presbyterians. Now yeah, we're going to Wycliffe, yeah, yeah it's yeah, all, all of that. that. Yeah. And so, but they want a Baptist school, but they want it close to what the other schools are doing and, and where they're located and so. So tell me what happens to the teaching of the Bible and why it has to move and how it's evolved to, now you are a professor in that discipline, but right. it's, it's very different. Well, it, it's, it stays central to what McMaster University is about well, it's here on Bloor Street, and then eventually there are some theological battles. They have to move uh, eventually as well for space, and so they moved to Hamilton. And in 1957, the university went over to the province. The denomination just couldn't sustain the university. It had grown so large, so many disciplines. But the theological part, the Bible part, remains with the founding of McMaster Divinity College in 57. And so right on the heart of McMaster University today, there's a theological college, McMaster Divinity College, that carries on McMaster's vision for the training of ministers, the training of pastors. Tell us the lessons you would take. You know, we see the conservatory, um, you know, as a place for music now. All the other disciplines, a different kind of university now created in Hamilton. Right. What's the lesson we can take from that for our witness and work as Christians who are passionate about an activist cause like McMaster was in his day? Well, I think of two things in particular, two lessons. One, uh, that to have a dream is one thing, um, but you need to work hard for that dream. McMaster had a dream to, to be involved in this Christianizing of the nation and the training and equipping of ministers and pastors, um, but it took work. When you read the history of, of the university, it's tedious week after week of work and labor. And so the first lesson is if you have a dream and you want to create something, it's going to require work. Even if you have power and money like he did, it's work, it's <laughs> labor, it's hard to do. Uh, the second lesson is how uh, 
one's legacy can, can come about. Uh, the legacy of McMaster would not have happened without his life, but it wouldn't have happened without his death as well. Meaning that the money, the endowment to endow the university with $900,000, which was a gigantic amount of money in the day, only came as a result of his death with his estate going all towards the university. And as someone who's had the joy of taking part-time courses like many people in the community do of the Divinity College at McMaster, it's awesome how the teaching carries on and the vision for how to be biblical in our culture carries on. Adam and Renee, you've been listening. Come on in and let's uh, see if the professor has sparked any curiosity for your generation as you hear the story of a great philanthropist trying to shape Canadian culture with the gospel. Well, I would ask, how today would you say uh, McMaster's legacy is being carried on forward through throughout the school? So that's a great question. I think his legacy continues in two ways. The first is just with what the Divinity College does in terms of training Christian pastors, leaders, educators, people who just you know, want to be better equipped to serve in the kingdom. So the Divinity College, which is a part of the whole university in that sense, carries on that legacy. But the other legacy of McMaster was to not just have Bible, but to have arts and to, to have all fields of study be a part of, of education and part of the university. And so the larger university, in one sense, is carrying on uh, McMaster's legacy uh, because his, his vision was much grander than, than, than Bible only. It was Bible in, in all fields of human endeavor in terms of study. Of course, the university now is, is a larger, provincially funded, secular university. And so that's very different from the vision of McMaster in, in one sense. But in another sense, the two are, are carrying on that legacy. Adam. Uh, was there much opposition, or was it everyone was on board? William McMaster wanted pretty well everything to shift to become a university in Toronto. McMaster University. And there was opposition to that. Uh, many want, there was already a Baptist school in Woodstock, Woodstock College. And so you had these two camps, some who wanted it to stay in Woodstock and others who wanted it to come to Toronto. And so there's a lot of pressure, a lot of discussion, mm -hmm. argument, you may want to say. And, and, but eventually McMaster won the day. He had the power, he had the prestige, he had the money, and he had the vision, he had the drive, and so eventually he won the day. Dr. He, thank you for just reminding us that somebody has to have a vision and create and give sacrificially and work hard, leave a legacy.